Quinn of Eastman is a highly respected New York attorney, Lucas A. Ferrara. The other is a self-proclaimed man of the people known as Mert Roberts. Their aim is to discuss the hottest issues impacting our city, state, and nation. Fasten your seatbelt. Shake it off with Mert and Lucas live starts now on AM 970. The answer. Welcome back. And we're speaking with Dr. Sarah Luderat, who is the author of a memoir called World's apart a memoir of uncertain belonging doctor you had mentioned that you wanted to share your email your book is available on amazon but if they want to reach out to you via email would you like to share it now this would be the perfect time well it's a well, the easiest one and the one that ties in with the title of the book is world for parts memoir at gmail.com so world for parts memoir all run together um, at that gmail.com so that would that, be the one that, i would want to share mm-hmm. And that if makes people sense. Are, like me, I can and want a copy, then I'd be very happy to send it to them with a, a signed copy of them with a little note. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wonderful, Doctor. Thank you so much. So in 1980, you moved to the U.S. Now, why the U.S.? What made you move to this continent? Well, my husband got a, um, a Fulbright Fellowship at the University of South Florida, and the economy had got very, very difficult in Ghana, um, there was a period of real mismanagement of the economy, and it was difficult to find foodstuffs or, or anything, really, to buy. And so we thought that for our children's future, we were better to try and, and move. And he got the opportunity in South Florida, and from there he was able to get a job at Harvard University. So that was um, what motivated us. It was a bad economy in Ghana, really. I'm happy to say things are very different in Ghana today. And you ended up working as a, uh, a consultant for General Physics Corporation. What exactly did you do, Doc? Well, General Physics Corporation is a funny name for it. Really, it was a company that was started by a professor out of Catholic University in Washington, D.C., to train the operators for the nuclear power plants that were coming online. And so he hired a cadre of people, many of whom had been technicians on the Navy submarines, and others had been graduates of the Naval Academy who had worked on the nuclear in the nuclear navy, and they provided a very strong cadre of people to provide the training that was needed by the operators of the nuclear plants. And because of my nuclear background and my background in education, it seemed like I would be a good fit. It seems like I would be a good fit, but it was a very difficult fit. Tell us more. Why was it difficult? Well, I needed the job. I mean, my husband had a, a job, but it was not at a very good salary, and, and I, you know, I'd always worked. I really wanted to, that, that um, outlet for my energies and my interests, and so I was very happy to get the job, but the difficulty was that uh, the environment was almost entirely male. Um, the people I was working with mostly did not have higher education. They were very bright. They worked at, uh, had extensive training in the nuclear navy, and uh, I was supposed to work with them to help implement some new standards which had put in, been put in place uh, following the Three Mile Island accident um, in 1979. I think that happened when there was that near meltdown, Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. And so they didn't know how to handle the new standards, and that was what I was thought in to help them with. But they didn't want the new standards, and they didn't want me. So uh, it was very difficult. Yeah, you talk about that in your book. You you also mentioned balancing the family and the job was exceedingly difficult. And kids, people that are listening, don't remember. Cell phones didn't exist in the 80s. Uh, so if you had to call someone, you had to find a telephone booth, which in and of itself can be a challenge, particularly outside of urban areas. So you talk about that, balancing a family, mm-hmm. trying to reach. Can you can you tell us about that difficulty, those challenges? The difficulty in finding people to look after the children. Is that what, uh, I'm quite catch that question. You know, the balancing having a family and a job where you couldn't easily communicate with the office, th- that challenge. Oh, yes. That's right. We didn't have cell phones in those days. So, I mean, fortunately, my work when I was in the office was, was close at home, so I could, um, you know, I could easily get home if I needed to, but I did travel quite a bit, and then it was difficult. Yes, well, we had telephones, but we didn't have cell phone, so it was much more difficult to be in touch. 
And if you were going to be late picking up a child from school, then you couldn't let them know and things like that. It was a, it was a different era. And, you know, you had to, because I was so much an outlier, I couldn't afford to put a step wrong at work where I knew I would be toast right away. So I had to, and I think eventually I got a lot of protection from the head of the head of the company because he he understood my university background better than the people I worked with. And eventually I made it out and, and did quite well. Um, but it, it was a tough time. And the kids, the kids were pretty good. They understood that, you know, I need to work. And so we got after school arrangements and so on for them. Tell us about your business quality training systems. What exactly did, did you do there? No, we, we basically it was a continuation of what I'd done with general physics, but I moved out of the nuclear arena to work for the people who run the, electric, the high voltage electric grid. And um, there, there was a, a, we were developing training programs for the people who, who operate out of control centers to make sure that the electric system across the U.S. works in sync. And it's a very complex operation. And when they don't do their job properly, things can go badly wrong, and you can get um, you can get bad blackouts. And, and of course, the blackout of 2003, or 1977, first of all, and then I think there was one in 1966, and then more recently 2003. And that really pushed the the, the government to require more training for nuclear operators. So um, we were there to not nuclear; these were operators of the grid. And we were there to help develop the training programs and help the trainers implement those programs. And I developed a software that was able to track all the regulations, which was quite successful and was used across the country in many, many different, many, many utilities. So, Doctor, let me ask you a question. Can I ask you an opinion yes. question? This is totally off topic. But do you okay. think our electric grid is vulnerable? The country's oh, electrical grid. Yes. Oh, yes. Very vulnerable. Think of all those substations. Well, that's you know, why I'm asking you. That's why yeah, I'm asking it's very you, Doc. Vulnerable. It's extremely vulnerable. And, but I know, at the same time, I know that the electric utilities work extremely hard to contain those vulnerabilities. Um, but, there was, but, but, Doc, like, I was reading that transformers, for example, they don't make parts in, the, in America anymore. Uh, isn't, is that part of the vulnerability as well, in your opinion? That could be. I, I wouldn't know about that particular one, and I would suspect that um, that they, they may be trying, you know, with, with, with conflict, trade conflict with China, I would expect that the U.S. is trying to do more of its own manufacture, but I don't know for a fact. That would be part of the vulnerability because those transformers are, are, are not just sitting on the shelf waiting for people to bring them in and, and install them. They certainly probably have to be ordered uniquely as one of a kind. But it's the exposure, and, and of course, everything is operated by electronic signals, so the the electronic communication uh, from the, to the power plants and to the substations is all extremely vulnerable. But at the same time, the industry has made enormous efforts to, uh, uh, to for cybersecurity to put in place regulations that will ensure cybersecurity. But you know, as as we saw last or a few days ago with the um, with the airports and so on, any little well, thing. Well, yeah, all the, all the airport, computers, all the computers shut down, Doc. Any, any little thing, the more you depend on computers, the more vulnerable you are. Yeah, and, oh, and boy. People, yeah, let, so, let, so, but, I mean, it's something the utilities are very well aware of and work hard to combat, but whether they're doing enough, I don't know. I've been out of the industry for a while now since I retired, but, yes, I think it's one of yeah, but I think a lot of experts are of the opinion that America is extremely vulnerable when it comes to its mm -hmm. grid systems. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, the, the our politicians need to be more proactive in improving what what you know what what we have. Uh, but Doc, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you this evening. Thanks so much for staying over. Uh, we we commend all of you to take a look at the doctor's new book, Worlds Apart: A, mem a Memoir of uncertain belonging. Doc, thank you for being the trailblazer that you were and are and for coming on our program this evening. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And don't let your audience forget they can always go to Amazon. The books are available there. Thank you very much. And we will do that. Have a wonderful evening, Doc. Thank you. And the same to you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for having me. Bye -bye. Thank you. So, Mert, what did you think? Well, you know, that last bit 
about the the grid you know yep, that, that that's me. the that that's very interesting right there because that is one of the main concerns that we should have as a country because it's happened other places where these hackers anonymous or something like that they'll come in and they'll start causing chaos with these grids the good thing about the united states is a lot of these hackers come from here and we got a lot of people who can counteract that but what happens if the person who's protecting us can no longer do it so these grids and you know the the, the it's just very concerning to think about and the fact that a woman of her stature has the same concerns that i have it lets me know that this is something we should take seriously because if all the power goes out forget the computer systems if the power goes out that means everything's done right how do we communicate how do we uh, yeah this is scary stuff and you know it's funny i think we may have broken some news there so the doc thinks that we're vulnerable still vulnerable and i'm concerned about that uh and i think we all should be uh communicating with our political leaders focus on the on the grid because i understand from my research a couple of uh, years ago the, the a lot of these transformers if they burn out or if, like some some people in california shot holes you know these activists shot holes in a transformer it takes months to replace them and you could have people out with no electricity for months at a time that is not acceptable and as she mentioned the computer outage that happened the other day where all these microsoft software and these security everything broke down and yet people sleeping at airports i'm still getting notices where they're saying sorry but due to a global out that is not acceptable we are too interrelated we are too intertwined that's vulnerability that's dangerous Yes, and I think this is all, you know, sometimes I think sometimes these instances are just tests that we need to have, sort of like COVID, where we shut everything down because we need to do a test. How would we react if there was a true pandemic? How would we react if all of the computer systems went down? So I think this latest computer outage with the Microsoft systems going down and it, it uh, uh, stranding a lot of people at airports, it's a good test because it didn't happen at a time. Now, it might be specific people who are really severely affected by this, but it didn't happen at a critical time. And, and you know, when we really need planes in the air and stuff like that, it didn't happen during a time of war where we're being attacked by a foreign nation or something like that. So I think it's good that these these little mini tragedies happen so that when they actually – when it comes time to really make sure things are up and running, we have some kind of plan in place because with all this new technology, there's not really an opportunity to run tests when this stuff fails. We kind of assume that the computer will always run. We kind of assume that the lights will always be on because there rarely are instances where these things don't work. So I think any opportunities we get there's this famous quote, don't let a tragedy go to waste. Well, I think what happened is a good opportunity to educate us and to put in proper protections against stuff like this from happening. I hope they're listening in Washington, D.C., Merck, because I'm not sure what what they've done to since COVID to make sure a disaster, you know, a a pandemic like that doesn't happen again. I've not heard anything positive. And I'm concerned about our vulnerabilities. The grid, the computer systems, the interrelationship of the world, too much, too much. What is, AI, what, what is, what is Alex AI, think? AI, AI what is bothers it? me. Yeah, yeah. What is, Alex, what do you think? Well, I, I don't want to get into conspiracies here, but I feel like four years ago, they did see how fast we were able to comply, if you will. And that is the scariest part maybe you both agree is that yes it could be preparing us i know covid was real i mean it was a pandemic but i think there was some undertones to that that uh that are pretty scary especially how quickly we were to shut down if you will and what would they pull this year that's kind of my concern actually yeah you know i didn't like the way they they forced people to get shots and they they, they made us stay in place 
Uh, there was a lot of psychological torture involved here. No masks, masks, you know, the, the whole thing, crazy. Did a lot of damage to a lot of young people, I understand. So, you know, kids in school, things of that nature. We're, just, we're not going to know the after effects for some time, but this is bad. This and is Lucas, bad. you mentioned it, what Washington is doing. It took them four years to get Governor Cuomo down to D.C. to answer for the nursing home crisis, four years for that uh, call to move all those who had COVID into the nursing homes. I mean, you remember that whole disaster. Yeah. Why did it take four years for that to be answered for? Uh, I'm not going to answer that, Alex, because we know the system. Government is incompetent. You want, you know, look, that's my, and I said this last week, government is not the answer. Okay. And that's that is the answer to your question. Shouldn't take four years. That's just incompetency. And by the way, before we we go to the break, because we have a few minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Alex, who you're listening to, um, has a wonderful podcast. It's called One Leg Up with Alex Garrett. And Alex sent me one of his more recent uh, episodes. And Alex is of the view that God intervened when the Secret Service failed. You know, New York Times had an article just a few days ago that many see this near miss as divine intervention. What is your take on that, Alex? Well, I want to amend it a little bit because I do not believe God wanted the hero firefighter to die. Let me put it that way. But Well, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, but yes. I some hear people what interpreted mean. what I was saying as that, so I want to clarify that. But no, the, I, in, never, I didn't get that. In I general, didn't get that impression. I, I just felt like God had intervened in that moment because if he was assassinated, it wouldn't be, you know, it, it would be the person, but it also would have been America would have been in chaos. So I feel like God had intervened in that moment. And some said that he might have had whispers in his ear. That didn't happen. That was just pure, uh, you know, divine intervention that he turned his head in such a way uh, that the bullet uh, grazed his ear. And we don't want anything to happen to, happen to our presence, former or present, right? No, look, look, we were talking about this uh, on Dottie's show, I for Real Estate. And Dottie believes, uh, we, he agrees with you that there may have been some form you know, of divine intervention, but look, I, I believe in God, uh, but let's, let, let's, let, let's have an argument here. What, what kind of God would set into motion or allow to reach uh, that far uh, a plot to assassinate a former I'll president? tell you, a, a God that allows for luck, chance, and everything in between to take place. So, Depending on it's, – it's like sports, and everybody has some kind of relationship to sports. I don't know if you're a fan of sports, but when your team wins on a last-second shot or a last – you know, the home run at the end of the ninth inning to win the game, you feel like God intervened. But if you're on the opposite side, you feel like it was the devil. So I think that depending on your perspective, your view, God is allowing – human beings to dictate what goes on and what happens and and everything in between so i think this guy him being a lousy shot not practicing or whatever being incapable being a nut job is what really saved donald trump because there was i've heard uh snipers speak about this there was no reason that that kid shouldn't have been able to hit donald trump if he was a, any kind of shot, any kind of proficiency at shooting a rifle, he should have been able to hit that hit Donald Trump. But because he was lacking in experience, he felt what he was trying to accomplish. So I think that God allows for chance, skill, and everything to take precedence over his divine intervention. Well, we'll have to save this debate for another time because we're uh, running into a commercial break. Well, if nothing else, though, I'm sure we can agree Trump was very lucky. We'll be back after this break, and we'll be joined by Robert McGinley. I'll introduce him when we come back.
Over the last 30 years, Newman Ferrara, a New York City law firm, has evolved into a national practice focused on real estate, commercial, litigation, civil rights, class actions, and other complex litigation, representing many of the city's largest property owners, managing agents, and thousands of tenants. Newman Ferrara handles some of the nation's most significant class actions and civil rights matters. Newman Ferrara at 1250 Broadway in New York City. Go online to NewmanFerrara.com. That's NewmanFerrara.com. Listen to the firm's name partner, Lucas Ferrara, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Dottie Herman's longest-running real estate radio program, Eye on Real Estate on AM 970. A real estate lawyer for 35 years, Lucas is a professor at New York Law School and is also a published author with books on real estate and New York's landlord tenant law. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. to hear Lucas's unique perspective and advice on Eye on Real Estate. Hey, it's Joe Piscopo on AM 970, The Answer. We called it. We called it right on the Joe Piscopo Show with Al and Joe and Debbie. Jen Kearns called in and said Joe Biden is out. She precisely predicted that Joe Biden would step away from the presidency. We only give you the best. Thank you, Jen Kearns, and thank you for listening to the Joe Piscopo Show on AM 970, The Answer. God bless the USA. If you're a business owner and a listener to AM 970, The Answer, you might not realize that the conservative news and talk content that you enjoy is advertiser supported. Our loyal audience loves to do business with the advertisers who make our programming possible. Now, it probably won't surprise you that there are some advertisers who avoid AM 970 because they don't like what we do here. That's their loss because our listeners are eager to support advertisers who support our conservative programming. To learn how to reach our audience with your business's message and support this station, please contact our general sales manager, Laura Schaefer, at gsm at nycradio.com or call 212-857-9639 or click on how to advertise at am970theanswer.com. That's am970theanswer.com. And remember, when you advertise on AM970, our loyal listeners know that you care about our programming as much as they do. This is Dennis Prager, and now a truly exciting new benefit. My monthly online video get-together for PragerTopia Plus members only. For an hour each month, get an exclusive chance to ask me anything. I'll be answering your questions. I've never done this. Submit your questions for me at PragerTopia.com. This is our chance to connect like never before. Go to PragerTopia.com or click the banner at DennisPrager.com. Welcome back to Shake It Off with Mert and Lucas, live on AM 970, The Answer. We are back to Shake It Off with Mert and Lucas, live on AM 970. Thanks so much for continuing to stay with us. Uh, We have another special guest for you, Robert McGinley. He's a writer, director, and actor. He is known for his skeet punk cult classic. Robert, I'm going to ask you what the heck that is. Shredder Orpheus, along with his award-winning action crime drama, Jimmy Zip, and the music-driven cyberpunk thriller, Devi Danger. Uh, Among the things that he's going to talk about tonight, how media and technology are being used to manipulate human consciousness and the collective decisions we make. Good evening, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. You know, pre-show, you and I had engaged in some email exchanges, and uh, uh, um, we'll we'll get to Biden and his dropping out in a a second. But what the heck is uh, this skate punk? What is that? Oh, well, it's, um, the, you know, the title of the film is, as I think you said, is Shredder Orpheus. Right. And I like to think that it's in line with the tradition of the Orpheus films that have been made in, in the past. It's, Orpheus is uh, 
a Greek myth. It's Western civilization's oldest love story. And so to that, um, I, uh, being a student of mythology and uh, in my younger years, very much a, a skate skater kind of guy, um, I got interested in the concept of what it would be like to skateboard to hell for your girlfriend. Well, basically, that is the rough outline of the Orpheus myth, where Orpheus in the Greek story is a musician who goes to the world of the dead, and he overcomes all kinds of obstacles to do that, to rescue his wife, Eurydice. And uh, he confronts Hades and makes an appeal to him that, hey, I need my wife to come back to me to the world of the living. And at first, there's a lot of resistance to that, but uh, uh, Hades' wife, Persephone, insists that it's an okay thing for him to do, that he should do it, because after all, you know, both Orpheus and his wife are going to be in, end up in the world of the dead anyway. So they're going to be back there anyway. So it's his appeal uh, you know, is successful. He plays for Hades and his court. And um, Orpheus was this magical musician who basically uh, used, you know, his gift as an artist to persuade Hades to let him go back to the world uh, with his wife. But the only problem was there was a caveat. And it's also uh, in Christian doctrine, too, the idea of you don't look back. And so Hades said, you can have your wife back on one condition, which is you don't look back at her. And so uh, as he goes through, you know, crosses the river Styx, which is the river of forgetfulness, and he probably was upended by that and at the last moment at the threshold of the, of the underworld he looks back at her and she's gone forever and so obviously you know it's a tragedy now to do this in a sort of semi-futuristic way with shredder orpheus i give a kind of a new slant on it and uh you know you have a skateboard guitar hero and uh it's um the movie is is a, a lot of it, it gathered a kind of a, a fans a fans for me that are um, you know I never dreamt that it would uh, have this kind of support I'm actually going to go up to Seattle and do another screening of the film for SIF uh, Cinema the Seattle International Film Festival and um, so you know is that, it's, is it's that the one of, on is that the one on August 1st correct Yes, yeah, August 1st. And then, you know, uh, so it's been a real ride to have this whole thing, you know, which I made basically, you know, 30 years ago, suddenly uh, in the last five years or so, have a, a, a new life. And, um, you know, um, you know, I got millennials and Gen Xs that are big fans of it and uh it did well when it came out modestly it's a very low budget film and uh you know it was just made on a whim and a prayer basically but anyway it people seem to really respond to the love story element of it and you would never know that from the title per se but you know it is the orpheus myth let me ask you. It sounds like an interesting film. I, I was watching. I, I visited your website and took a peek at some of your films. Mind control seems to be the big theme. If I were to simplify it, what what is what is your obsession with that? And tell us a little bit about your your theory about this. The, uh, as I said during the intro about how our consciousness is being manipulated. What, what's what's up with that? Yeah, well, let, let's just put it in the context of Sh Shredder Orpheus for a minute. Um, the underworld in that in the film is called the Euthanasia Broadcast Network, and it's it's the EBN or the Euthanasia Broadcast Network is modeled after evangelical television, which basically you know requires us to as viewers to you know praise the ray, if you will. And the whole concept is uh, that I'm you know, basically a lifelong concept has been, you know, looking at the way media co-ops, 
consciousness and that you know we are uh, victims of manipulation on a, on a big scale unless you know you really take the time to do some critical thinking about the way media is per, put in front of you you know um, and uh, you know I think we have the internet now which is much more sophisticated than when I made the film which you know was basically television and that, that was the vehicle for you know basically consumer buy to manipulate consumer buying habits and and basically you know manipulate behavior and I think you know not to get um, you know too over the top with it but I think unless you're a critical thinker you may just be um, ready to just ride the wave and I, I think that what I'm trying to do is draw attention to the fact that you know we are being manipulated and now it's much worse I mean the prologue to uh, my new film called Cataclysmic basically says that um, in the near future a company called Neurotech Industries is the leader in legacy technology using human surveillance methods to capture market and sell its data to advertisers so as we all know that you know when you can just casually mention something that you might be interested in getting like a couch or something and if your computer is open and you have a certain apps like facebook or something suddenly you're you know on your feed you know you'll suddenly see oh there's an advertisement for may's department store and the, the couches that are available i mean those kinds of things are really uh creepy creepy to me so i think yeah, it's that, coming uh, it's coming to fruition is absolutely right because if you talk to a friend about pizza all of a sudden a pizza commercial pops up but but you know robert uh you we're going to be going to a break in a few minutes and we're going to continue your movies talk about corporations wanting to control us almost to the point of making us robots don't you think ai is going to facilitate that and make that a reality your fear a reality yeah i i definitely have that fear and i think um you know i've been doing a lot of research on well what's the alternative and um, that's where I think uh, many pundits, including uh, folks like um, Kurzweil, who is a, sort of the f founder of, uh, or been, been the earliest observer of the effects of AI, all say that unless we are, adapt and are able to have the same, a, a kind of, a, brain computer interface ourselves we won't be able to keep up and i think that that is something that is already happening with uh elon musk company called Neuralink. they're already doing uh implant surgery to help uh, paraplegics and other uh you know brain malfunction uh diseases um and i think eventually you know that is the one possible way that we can keep up. Now, not everybody's going to want to do that, right? So the practicality of that is tough. So, you know, there is a possibility that you will have a designated, um, you know, you're hopefully access to somebody that can help you keep, back, keep up. Um, but the even more larger fear that I have for AI is that um, you know rogue governments will want to use this as a weapon system to create weapon systems that are uncontrollable and uh, we have you know a bleak dystopian future that's similar to the Terminator that kind of thing Oh boy, Robert, we have to break, uh, we have to take a break, but so hang on. But we were talking about the threats to the power grid. It's very real. But we'll be back after this commercial break to continue our discussion with Robert.
Over the last 30 years, Newman Ferrara, a New York City law firm, has evolved into a national practice focused on real estate, commercial, litigation, civil rights, class actions, and other complex litigation, representing many of the city's largest property owners, managing agents, and thousands of tenants. Newman Ferrara handles some of the nation's most significant class actions and civil rights matters. Newman Ferrara at 1250 Broadway in New York City. Go online to NewmanFerrara.com. That's NewmanFerrara.com. Listen to the firm's name partner, Lucas Ferrara, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Dottie Herman's longest-running real estate radio program, Eye on Real Estate on AM 970. A real estate lawyer for 35 years, Lucas is a professor at New York Law School and is also a published author with books on real estate and New York's landlord tenant law. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. to hear Lucas's unique perspective and advice on Eye on Real Estate. War has played a key role in the history of the United States from the nation's founding right down to the present. Wars made the United States independent, kept it together, increased its size, and established it as a global superpower. Hi, I'm James Early, host of the Key Battles of American History podcast. In each episode, I discuss American history through the lens of the most important battles of America's wars. To start listening now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search Key Battles of American History on your favorite podcasting platform. They're Trump's most diehard fans in the front row at every Trump rally. You had to love the United States of America. You had to support Mr. Donald Trump's re-election. Trump's front row, Joe's, is the new two-part documentary offering the first inside look at the men and women standing shoulder to shoulder with Trump in the greatest political movement in American history. The kind of basis for all the rallies, they're just like dead fans. Trump, Trump, Trump. Like-minded people following their hero all around the country, exhausting their bank accounts, camping out for days in the freezing cold and scorching heat to support Trump's re-election and make America great again. The Front Row Joes are very successful, incredible people. Trump's Front Row Joes, from executive producer Sean Spicer, former White House press secretary and communications director for President Donald J. Trump. Friendships I've made over the years as a Front Row Joe, it's probably the best part of it. Don't miss Trump's Front Row Joes. Watch it now. Go to SalemNow.com. SalemNow.com. As a local business owner, you get called every week by marketing companies. We get it. We have hundreds of satisfied customers. Here's what a satisfied client recently said. Open enrollment is going great. We're hitting record numbers. Thank you so much for this report. It really is amazing to see how the marketing is really shaping our enrollment around the city. If you're a local business and ready for the next step, Google Salem Surround New York right now. Our experts are ready to help you take your marketing to the next level. Google Salem Surround New York today. Welcome back to Shake It Off with Mert and Lucas, live on AM 970, The Answer. Welcome back uh, to Shake It Off with Mert and Lucas, live. What a show. First, we have to worry about the, the power grid. Then we have to worry about AI. And we're speaking with Robert McGinley. Robert, sent me an email a couple of weeks ago where he told me that he was a witness to the carnage of the 1968 convention. But before we get to that, my, my good friend Mert has a question for you. Mert. Yes, I want to ask you about, you, you think that, you know, technology is forcing us to think in a similar way or can, it might have the possibility to control us. Don't you think that the Internet has kind of made that more difficult because everybody is into their own thing? So what you're searching for on Instagram, Twitter and Google is not going to be what I'm searching for on those same platforms. So don't you think that it it's a little bit more difficult now for the for big technology to focus in and control us because we're able to look at whatever we deem pleasurable or whatever specific thing we want to dive into we have the power to focus on whatever that is instead of somebody telling us what to focus on well here's my pushback on that and that would be true if we were were able to really have the discipline of stepping outside of what the algorithms are pushing because you've got to remember 
you know, the platforms that we're on, they want to know what we like. And as soon as they get wind or as soon as we start liking something or even just engaging with content, we're immediately fed more of that. And so, you know, just circling into the political divisions in our country, technology is really responsible for creating silos of belief systems because we have on both sides of the aisle, both right and left, we have different information systems that were being fed. And it's only people who, again, who go the extra mile and want to, you know, see. And, I, and there are many people who do, but I think the most strident, ardent, extreme voices on right and left are religiously locked into the, um, you know, the silos of information that they're getting because the technology doesn't really encourage, you know, looking at different points of view. And that's a big reason that we have so much division in our country. So I think until we start recognizing that, you know, it's a problem. And, you know, to, just to go to the um, conversation you had before after your last guest, I think we're talking about things that go from the political to the spiritual at a, at a certain point. I think that is a very interesting dynamic that eventually we will be able to liberate ourselves from uh, the information, um, you know, uh, hegemony, if you will, that will get, it'll give us an opportunity to be more expansive and broader in, in our outlook. But right now, it's really tough. And I, so my pushback is that we don't have a lot of choices unless we go the extra mile. Now, we, we only have a few minutes left, Robert, and I did want to ask you, because you had sent me an email and said that you were a witness back in 1968 mm -hmm. to the carnage that occurred during the Democratic Convention in Chicago, that you're from Chicago and you witnessed mm -hmm. what happened at that time. It was a very sad time. And you wrote to me the following. Joe Biden's candidacy could accelerate the dismantling of democracy. Now, Joe, of course, is not running for re-election, mm -hmm. but do you still think that a, a, a Democrat generally would, would, would facilitate or accelerate, accelerate the democracy's dismantling? Do you still believe that? Well, I think he, both candidates and, you know, the flags that they are carrying right now are part of the dissolution process. It's not just one candidate or another. It's not just Kamala, if it, if it turns out to be Kamala or Donald Trump. What we're looking at is a dismantling of the Constitution and democracy. And basically, it's, uh, you know, there's no question that Donald Trump is a transformative character in the sense that, you know, his promise to uh, create a autocratic style of government that actually could be considered a plutocracy, you know, that it's wealth generated. So you have people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk throwing their weight behind him because they like the, the tax concepts that he's promoting. But really, I don't know if it's one candidate or another. I don't know if, if Joe Biden was still in the race. I was saying that only because I thought, well, he's, still, he's going to be stubbornly still running and he's going to get beat really badly. And but, you know, I will tell you right now that if Trump wins, then we are going to end the experiment that we've started in 1789 with the, the Constitution that he will, you know, maybe what he says he'll do is different than what he will actually do. But for right now, we're on notice that a big change will come. And, and even if if um, he loses there's going to it's going to be contested so we're going to have a lot of anger and a lot of uh violence uh that whether hopefully it's just remains rhetorical but i think we're going to have physical violence that accompanies this election uh no matter which candidate comes out on top because i think that that's we we i think we're just in that process of you know taking something and 
letting it go right down to the ashes with the Supreme Court ruling, uh, you know, that a president can do anything he wants, then I think, well, that's pretty autocratic, you know. I mean, technically, now that Biden's resigned uh, from continuing the race, what's to stop him from arresting Donald Trump for his alleged crimes? And, you know, then you have a whole other crazy situation. And in the Supreme Court would say, well, yeah, that's our ruling. And that was an official act putting Donald Trump in jail. Why not? Well, that would be crazy. That would be chaos. That would be that would be look, everything the Democrats have done to hurt Donald Trump have only empowered him. The criminal mm-hmm. prosecutions, everything. Well, I, but the Supreme Court, th- th- that was something that Donald Trump did. I, I, I get what you're saying, but yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, politics is, uh, is, a, is a complicated dance, and uh, the Democrats are certainly not free of guilt as, as, you know, when it comes to this divisiveness. Okay. I, and I don't and I don't disagree with that at all. I think I think it basically for me, both religious and p- political ide- ideologies are becoming more ob- obsolete. I'm looking at what's going to make the regenerative process work. What's going to make the transformation in consciousness that recognizes that all humans come from one spark, that really we are in this together and this planet with all the things that are going on with climate change and your discussion with the grid situation, all that stuff, it's it's not going to work very well unless we come together. So what do you think will bring us together? Another tragedy? You know, that's a great question. I, I, I think that, um, I think we really, we are looking at, um, because you know, you know 9/11 God. I yeah. never saw such unity after you know after the towers fell that's a uh, great point I totally agree with that and I think that that I think between climate change and um, is probably a big unifier because basically it's affecting us in so many ways I mean there's studies now Lucas that um, say that you know um, the whole planet with the increasing heat is affecting our brains and and we're more irritable we're more prone to fight we're more prone and that's why i'm really concerned that um it's going to take something on the magnitude of that kind of tragedy there was just an article out uh, there was just information out this week that because of the melting polar ice caps the planet is changing shape and that with the shape change it's rotating slower so a 24-hour day is not what it used to be we're adding seconds to it so we're doing we're 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 make, changes are happening that we're not really conscious of right now collectively but well, you know what's funny be- you know what's funny about that robert if it's mm-hmm. adding seconds maybe we get to live a little longer we all have to <laughs> but unfortunately we've run out of time how's that for irony um, oh, so, all right robert, well, thank think, you so much i feel much like we're for, just getting started but uh, yeah, thank you so much thank you so much for a very interesting conversation how do people where's what is your website how do people find you oh yeah 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 please come to boom cult dot com that's boom b o o m c u l t dot com and uh, if you go to social media it's at boom cult media uh, is our handle on all social media and uh, you can go there and see clips of all the films you can see uh, basically the whole polemic between all all the stuff is there thank you Robert we're running out of time thank you and have a wonderful evening so guys Mert Alex, yes. That that concludes show two. Would you believe it? Where did the time go? Thank you so much, guys, for a great show. And for those of you out there listening, thank you much so much for being part of our family. And if you love us, call us. If you love us, tune in. We'll be here next week, hopefully, at Sunday evening, 7 p.m. See you then. Good night, everyone.
preceding program is sponsored by Shake It Off Live, LLC. Over the last 30 years, Newman Ferrara, a New York City law firm, has evolved into a national practice focused on real estate, commercial, litigation, civil rights, class actions, and other complex litigation, representing many of the city's largest property owners, managing agents, and thousands of tenants. Newman Ferrara handles some of the nation's most significant class actions and civil rights matters. Newman Ferrara at 1250 Broadway in New York City. Go online to newmanferrara.com. That's NewmanFerrara.com. Listen to the firm's name partner, Lucas Ferrara, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Dottie Herman's longest running real estate radio program, Eye on Real Estate on AM 970. A real estate lawyer for 35 years, Lucas is a professor at New York Law School and is also a published author with books on real estate and New York's landlord tenant law. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. to hear Lucas's unique perspective and advice on Eye on Real Estate. 